together for it. <laughs> now, the other thing, often during these, it becomes necessary to stop, you know, for one reason yeah, or another. Right. And uh, I'll just try to go cut, you know. And You're going to make a motion yeah, rather than Do you want it here or up there? Up there, you're up there, there would be fabulous. Put it far enough away that you don't knock it over. Okay, I think we can do this. <laughs> oh, <wait. coughs> Just a minute. Today is June 18th, 2004, and this tape is one of a series of interviews of North Fork women for our archives committee. Uh, I'm Anne Mackay, Lucy Steele is on the camera, and today we're talking with Karen Sauvigny, who's been part of our North Fork gang for quite a while. Um, she, uh, excuse me a sec, she is our high-powered executive director, athlete, feminist, activist, and is going to go down in the history books for creating the term in 1975, sexual harassment on the job. She's created training programs, testified at hearings, been on TV, done all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, but let's start with the North Fork. Uh, Karen, you came here visiting first. Right, uh, I first came as a visitor and stayed with Susan Forbes and Venetia Han one summer in the past. It must have been in the <laughs> 70s, but I don't remember exactly mm -hmm. when. Right, late 70s. <clears throat> and then came as a visitor the weekend of The Revels, the play that you and produced. And you made arrangements for me and my then partner, Jessica Jackson, who was the lighting director of the right. Rebels, to stay with Mary Dorman in the windmill barn that she owned. <laughs> Tower then. house, yeah. yeah. Um, right. And Jessica and I just fell in love with the North Fork and had a wonderful time there. Although, for many years after that, I continued to rent summer houses on the South Fork. And it wasn't until Martha Stark and I got together in 1987 and rented a house in Orient that I realized how much I loved this place and how much more akin to my soul and my interests it was. I have to interrupt to say that my family goes way back on the North Fork. I spent my summers in Mattituck as a child, and in Mattituck and Jamesport one year. And my parents both spent their summers on the North Fork when they were children. So my connection back to here goes back to the 30s. And I've been to and visited yeah. the homes that each of my parents spent summers in when they were kids. Wow. So, so and you're, I, uh, you're really the third I'm the person. third generation of, well, <clears throat> no, I guess my parents are, I, I'm the second generation. But we've also got... Dottie Abbott, we've got a couple of other people who the same thing went to, uh -huh. came out from it. Uh, you bought this house in 1988. We bought this house in 88, Martha Stark and I did after she persuaded me that although we hadn't even been together for a year, that it was not a grave risk <laughs> to invest in real estate. We've now been together nearly 18 years, so I guess she was right. <laughs> we bought this house from a pair of men who had lived in it for about 11 years and who bought it from Jane Chambers and Beth Allen. Um, and it was Jane and Beth who converted this house from a utility barn to a home. Jane, I'm sure you know, Anne is the lesbian playwright who wrote Last Summer at Bluefish Cove. I'm told by Beth that she wrote that play in what is now our second bedroom, although it was written about a time when she lived in a different house not very, half a mile from here. I remember when she came down, she was very excited <laughs> having done it. <laughs> okay, see? Yeah. Um, so we've lived here 18 years, and I you know, love the life out here, the simpleness of it, the fact that you can get your permit and go collect clams, and in the good years, scallops and crabs, uh, that we keep our little boat at a mooring you know, in a town launch area where it costs us forty dollars a year. It's a wonderful little gaff rigged boat. It, it's a gorgeous little gaff rigged sailboat, cat boat, Cape Dory cat boat named Wildcat. Um, it's traditional that you should name 
a, a cat boat with a cat name. So we picked one we thought was appropriate for the use um, that we intended to have of it. I'm also a windsurfer, um, which is a more solitary sport. You can't put anyone else on your windsurfer with you. Um, but I'm, it, it's actually my most favorite sport. I, at these days, only windsurf when, the, when there's white caps when the wind is blowing at least 15 knots. Um, I remember seeing you go off into a gale. <laughs> I, you know, most people are coming home from the beach when I'm heading out with my windsurfer. And when I was first learning to do it, Martha used to enjoy sitting on the beach and reading a book and watching me windsurf. But now it's not fun to be on the beach with the sand blowing in your face <laughs> when I'm having fun windsurfing. So it's become even more solitary. For me, but it is, I just love it. I love the speed of it. I love the lightness of it. Uh, you know, I love that it's on the water. And for my 50th birthday, we had a party here at Pocatuck Hall in Orient that both you two attended, where my friends all chipped in and bought me a dry suit in order to extend mm, yeah. the windsurfing season a few months in the spring. Yeah. I could start <laughs> earlier. I could and a little later. Um, I'm a little bit of a windsurfing fanatic. Uh, um, I thank you for your contribution to that, both of you. Uh, the, uh, but you've also been involved in other North Fork things. You played a little baseball and did something. Oh, I only play yeah. baseball uh, as a filler in. I'm a, I'm a really good runner. And so people who can't run, I sometimes I'm a pinch runner. I'm nowhere near and Lucy, who's been playing at almost all the games that ever happened, knows that I, I'm scared of the ball. Yeah. I, don't, I, I, don't, I can hit okay. I can run really good. Yeah. So I serve as you a have to be runner. persuaded. But you were involved in some of the little boat ins we had where we got yes. a lot of boats out. Yes, we used to, on the full moon, the night of the full moon, we used to bring our boats out and have, and, you know, float them together, raft them together, right. and. Um, share repasts um, <laughs> as the sun was setting and the moon was yeah. rising. We haven't done that in a while. No. There's not so many little no. boats in that, uh, that are ours boats. <laughs> in that bay anymore. I think somebody's planning to do something this year. Good. All right, let's move to your career, which has been fantastic. Uh, right now, you're the Executive Director of Administration, Public School, School of Public Affairs, Baruch College, CUNY. Uh, and you've been in many other places. Um, the CUNY, how did you avoid law school since you've been in all this <laughs> law environment? That's, that's interesting. My first job actually after I finished graduate school was on the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU. That's not on my resume so you probably don't know yeah. it. But in those days my immediate supervisor was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, oh. uh, who now has oh. a rather lofty job in the legal profession as a member of the Supreme Court. And she was, you know, I saw her every single day. She walked into the office every day and said, good morning, Karen. And even then, I had the sense that if she bumped into me on the street, she wouldn't recognize me. Mm -hmm. The reserve that she seems to have is her nature. Mm -hmm. um, but she was a brilliant litigator um, and one of the founders of the Women's Rights Project at ACLU and I, you know, was just a low-level clerical person on that staff, but proud to be there. And I have worked in law a lot. I spent 11 years at CUNY Law School, two and a half years at the Law Student Civil Rights Research Council, but, you know, you have to invest three years oh. <laughs> in law school. And I already had invested two in graduate school in history. And, you know, I now look back on it and wish I had done it, but every opportunity I had when I could have done it, I chose to do something else. So, Well, I think you've done some terrific things. Tell us about the uh, most recent one, being Executive Director of the Legacy Foundation. The Legacy Foundation is a national lesbian fa community foundation that's created to raise money and make grants to support lesbian community projects and scholarships. Uh, we had chapters in six or eight cities, I can't I think it was eight cities by the time I left there, and made scholarship awards to probably 20 or 25 young lesbian women 
over the, you know, each year, mm -hmm. as well as supporting lesbian health projects, le lesbian film and video projects. Um, Dee Mossberg is doing a video of women and lesbians in sports, and we helped provide the seed money for that some years back, quite a few years back. That's great. How did you first get uh, interested in uh, women's rights? How did I first... Well, was That's it Cornell? A... No, actually, my first... I was in a consciousness reason group in 1970 when I was a graduate student in history at Rutgers. And two of the other graduate students and I were reading Notes from the First Year, which was this pamphlet of feminist writing, and decided we wanted to see what it would be like to do a consciousness raising group. And you know, we were already anti war activists and students' rights activists, and but in the history department, there was just a small number of women, I don't remember. The proportion, but I know that there were no women on the faculty of the mm -hmm. history department mm -hmm. when I was there at Rutgers in 1970. So we were a small contingent and decided that we would find some other women, including we ended up including in our group the wives of some of the male graduate students. And we had a CR group, and it met its first many meetings were on some weekly basis, let's say Wednesday nights, in my ha apartment, because I was the only single woman in the group. And then after a little while, the women started saying, I want my husband to have to leave. Um, <laughs> and so I want the meeting. It's too easy for him that it's always not at our house. So it, after that, it was never at my house, because it was too easy. Um, and I did that, and then in 71, when I moved to New York City, one of the motivations for doing that was that I had met some people from New York Radical Feminists. And I decided, and I joined that organization and went to their, and joined a consciousness raising group through New York Radical Feminists and went to the monthly meetings that we held at New York Theological Seminary in the West Teens. On Sunday nights, we had a monthly meeting. Susan Brown Miller was active in that, and Evan Morley, and you know, a long list of mm -hmm. leaders in the mm -hmm. feminist movement. And I belonged to a consciousness raising group associated with that, and then got involved in the a coalition of groups that involved New York Radical Feminists, New York Now, and Lesbian Feminist Liberation, or LFL. Um, that we're doing sort of co collaborative political work on issues of women's rights, not just lesbian rights. And so we did some child care demonstrations um, and equal pay and anti-rape demonstrations. Not that these aren't lesbian issues, but that they are not specifically lesbian issues. And later on, I was telling you this earlier, and I became political director of LFL. And one of the many exciting things that we did during those years is someone, I can't remember who, who was inside at NBC got information that a TV serial that was running every week in those days, I think named Police Woman, um, with a, the star in it was Angie Dickinson, if I'm correct about this was going to have an episode in which a young girl would, was arrested and would be sent to jail where she would encounter a gang of lesbians in the jail. <laughs> and the gang of lesbians would sexually assault her with a broom. <laughs> and we were outraged that the first portrayal we saw of a lesbian on television was going to be a group sexually assaulting a sweet, innocent <laughs> girl in a jail. And so, <laughs> this inside person told us, in, in those days, I don't know if it's done any longer, serials often had screenings in the studio, in NBC, in this case. Um, it, you know, the week before the show was going to air so that the sponsors could see it. And I was told where the screening was going to be, and I 
dressed in business attire, which I think I must have had to borrow from someone. Um, and I, I now dress in business attire every day at work. Um, and went into this screening and watched it and was quite offended. And when it was over, I stood up and made some little speech about how this is an outrage against lesbians and this portrayal is derogatory. And I distributed it to all the sponsors in the room literature, you know, a flyer about why they shouldn't sponsor this show. The show actually did air, so it's, <laughs> they didn't, they, I don't know whether any pulled their ads from it for that or any other reason. Um, but we also, I scouted out where the NBC censor's office was, and we asked for a meeting with the NBC censor, but were denied it. And so one day, a day or two before the show was going to air, I went in, you know, in those days there was no security in the building lobbies, and I know what, knew what floor to go in, and I again dressed in business attire, and went in and up in the elevator to the floor that the censor's office was, and then at the same, you know, within the same 20 minutes, a bunch of other women from LFL went to other floors and all then gathered in the same staircase, let's say staircase A, I don't remember. And I went out staircase A and following the instruction that I learned from the Watergate burglars, <laughs> put duct tape on the door so that it wouldn't lock. And at a prearranged time, everyone gathered outside that door and sat in, and went and sat in in the NBC censor's office and demanded that he take the show off the air, which of course he didn't, but our, I left at that point because I was coordinating the on the street part of the demonstration. Um, but our people ended up sleeping, you know, being locked into the building overnight in the NBC censor's office. They had a little flag that they flew out the window that <laughs> says, NBC works against lesbian civil rights. I remember this because it was our chant. And we were walking around in a circle on the street saying this, and we got a little bit of press coverage for it which was our goal. I mean, it would have been nice to get the show pulled, but to get some attention for the fact that this was, there were very few images of lesbian in, the, in television. This must have been 1974. Um, maybe three, maybe, not five. Um, that there were very few les images of lesbians and that this one had to be of lesbians sexually assaulting a girl. <laughs> you know, give me a break. That's not, that's not what we're about. So anyhow, that was one of my uh, political activities in New York City. When Before I left to go to Ithaca to take the job at Cornell, which was where I was working when we encountered Carmita Wood and started doing the work on sexual harassment and employment. Yeah. But you were going to ask something. Uh. I've lost it, Whatever. so go ahead. <laughs> um, I was working at the Human Affairs Program at Cornell in 1975, and I was, the three of us who were working at the Human Affairs Program, although there was a large group of women who did this work, were me, Susan Meyer, who comes out here sometimes to visit Chris Larkin. Um, and Lynn Farley, and a woman who was enrolled in Lynn's class talked about an experience where she had been the subject of unwanted sexual attentions from her male boss um, and had been unable to get him to stop this pattern of sexual attention and had finally had to quit her job because she couldn't bear, she was afraid to be around him, and she couldn't bear the stress that it was causing her. And she then came to the Women in Work section at the Human Affairs Program, which is the program, the kind of civil rights, social change oriented program that we were all working in, um, to see if we could help her. And we realized that to a person, everyone, every one of our students, and every woman on the staff of the program had experienced something like that at some point in their lives. And not a one of us had ever told anyone. Uh, so we realized that this 
we know it wasn't a representative sample, but in our sample, 100% of the women, it, was, it seemed pretty widespread, and it also was unspoken. And so we decided, based on my experience at New York Radical Feminist, that we would have a speak out. That's how New York Radical Feminist, speaking out is public consciousness raising. You, you talk, it's only women, you talk about your real personal experience, but it's not a small group of six or eight or ten, it's one or two or three hundred. We decided we would have a speak out in Ithaca, New York, on sexual harassment. Uh, well, we had to figure out what to call it. And I remember sitting around in an office at the Human Affairs Program trying to decide whether it was sexual coercion or sexual uh, intimidation uh, or yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. And we decided that harassment was a word that was big enough to cover everything from right. sleep with me mm -hmm. or you're fired mm -hmm. to you know sexual jokes and innuendos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we named it. Um, and we are widely credited mm -hmm. um, <laughs> with having done that. And I think the important thing was not so much naming it, but breaking the silence. That Speak Out was the first public event that anyone knows of where women talked about their personal experience with sexual harassment. And the Speak Out mechanism is, in feminism, a device to learn, to make the personal political, um, and to learn who we are and what women's experience is by listening to women. And so we did that um, and ended up creating a movement that fewer than 10 years later resulted in the Supreme Court defining sexual harassment as a form of sex discrimination under Title VII. Um, they did that in 1985 in a case named Vincent v. in the Vincent case. Um, and, you know, in the interim, Working Women's Institute had set up a national legal network. Uh, we had, in the interim, we had formed Working Women's Institute, which was the grassroots group of women in Ithaca, transformed into a, an institute that did research and counseling and legal work, and ultimately moved to New York City in 1977, and Ms. Magazine did a, feat, a cover story about us in 1977, and we started getting a lot of attention, starting after the Speak Out for this issue in not just Ms. Magazine, in McCall's and Ladies Home Journal, in the non-feminist women's press, um, although they were all feminists, really. <laughs> they really were. Um, Mademoiselle, did I say that? Teen no, Magazine. No, no. Um, and we built, among other things, a legal referral network and a legal backup center where we kept track of briefs and cases and materials that people were using to advance litigation protecting women from sexual harassment in employment. And we did that and, kept, and it kept snowballing and eventually resulted in a series of federal district court and then federal appellate court cases that found sexual harassment was sex discrimination and ultimately it was brought to the Supreme Court and it was decided in May Great. of 1985 Great. or six, one of those two years. Mm -hmm. um, Amazing. And that's so, where you met Mary Dorman, she was helping out with some of this? Mary, that's right. Mary Dorman was a lawyer in private practice in New York City, and I don't remember exactly how I met her, but pretty early after meeting her, she ended up working on some of the pamphlets that we were developing called the Know Your Rights series. Um, they were little 10-page pamphlets for working women on what are your rights in relation to sexual harassment as a form of sex discrimination, as a form of, you know, as a violation of personal integrity, as a tort, as a labor law violation? I mean, I think Mary worked on the one that was about how it, sexual harassment was a negligent tort. Um, so, 
And, and she also at that time handled, or sometime shortly after that, handled a case at the United Nations involving yeah. sexual harassment yeah. and employment. Yeah. Uh, so, and, but we were building a network of women all over the country. We had a map of the United States on our wall, and we had a pin. A red pin meant that we knew a lawyer in that city. Uh, and a green pin, pin, pin meant we knew a counseling center in that city. And if you were a pin on our map, well, sometimes it meant there was only one pin, even if there were six lawyers, and then you had to go to the card file. This is before electronics. You had to go to the card file to find out you know, who were the people. But if you were on our map, it meant we had given you backup materials about how to identify sexual harassment, what were women's legal options, how to know how to bring a lawsuit, you know, what were the causes of action. Um, and we were also conducting research about you know, the volume of cases that you were getting and the, you know, in your center or in your practice and the forms that it was taking so that we were learning things and we had a research director on staff who was a, you know, PhD social psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lawyer on staff. We had a MSW counseling director. I mean, we were a big little organization run out of the basement of a church underlooking Park Avenue <laughs> yeah. um, in the East 60s. Can you believe the change? If you had asked me in 1975 whether 10 years later <laughs> people, the Supreme Court was going to define it as sexual harassment, I would have said no way. I'd worked on rape. I knew that it, you know, that it was nowhere near being taken seriously. You know, it was, it was the united effort of women around the country um, deciding that we saw a wrong, and, mm -hmm. and it was a wrong against us, mm -hmm. and we were going to right it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not like it doesn't still happen. I heard a story just last week. Um, and, of course, Anita Hill was um, castigated for her claims that she had been sexually harassed by now Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Um, in the time leading up to his confirmation, or during his what confirmation year was hearings. That? I think that was 90. Early. Two? Yeah. yeah, early. No, no, no. It was during the four. first Bush administration, because it wasn't Clinton yeah, yeah, yeah. who tried to appoint. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it was 90, 89 or 90. Um, and I. You know, because I did a lot of this pioneering work on sexual harassment, I have, when Working Women's Institute folded in about 1985, we gave our legal brief bank to the Women's Rights Legal Center at Rutgers and our counseling information mm -hmm. to the Barnard Women's Center and our mm -hmm. legal referral network to the Cornell Women and Work Center. So we dispersed a lot of our resources. But I maintained my own personal library and file, it's only one file drawer of materials. And every so often a graduate student in women's studies calls me up on the phone or finds me somehow and asks if she can interview me or come look through my files. And about three years ago, a student was going through my files and she found an old carbon copy, you know, the mm -hmm. flimsy mm -hmm. carbon copies mm -hmm. of a letter I had written in 1980 to Clarence Thomas when he was the new incoming director, of, I'm sorry, it was in 81, of the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. He had replaced Eleanor Holmes Norton, who was a member of the Working Women's Institute Advisory Board and, had, and who had issued sexual harassment guidelines under the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. He was planning to rescind those guidelines and mm. I wrote him a, a letter arguing that he should not do that. And, you know, and I cited some of our data and, you know, I tried to be as reasoned and persuasive and dignified as I could. And I signed it as, you know, Karen Sauvignet, Executive Director of Working Women's Institute, and I copied a few other women's rights organizations. Well, it turns out that was just about exactly the time that he was sexually harassing Anita Hill. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this, this graduate student pulled this thing out and said, do you know what you have here? <laughs> and I have since had it on my wall. You know, I got it framed and <coughs> put it on the wall in my office. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, 
When did you get on television? What, what oh my God, I was on television from local Ithaca co television covered this story in advance of the speak out, which was yeah. in May of 75. Uh, so I was on television starting then, and then we moved to the big time Syracuse and Rochester and, you know, Binghamton, and eventually, after the Speak Out, the New York Times covered the Speak Out. Um, and after that, we started getting more calls. And then when Ms. Magazine did the cover story, which was the October 1977 issue, let me inter digress for a moment to say that they struggled really hard with how they were going to depict sexual harassment as a cover story because they didn't want to have a real person. They didn't want a photograph of someone really sexual ha yeah. harassing mm -hmm. someone. So they got these little dolls. I mean, they made up these little puppet dolls. And there's this woman with this very distressed face, doll of a woman with a very distressed face and a man doll has his hand inside her shirt. Um, and that's how Ms. Magazine came to be able to put a cover story that they didn't think was licentious in and of itself. Um, so anyhow, they did a cover story on sexual harassment. And after that, we were just inundated with phone calls. And Susan Meyer and I, who were still running Working Women's Institute at that time, Lynn had gone off to work on a book that she brought out maybe a year or so later on sexual harassment. So Susan and I were on the Phil Donahue show and on Good Morning America mm -hmm. and on the Mike Douglas show and all over the place talking about sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. And we learned, the first time my mother ever saw me on television, <laughs> her reaction, she saw the Phil Donahue show, she knew I had gone, it was in Chicago in those days, they flew us out there. Um, she knew I was going to be on and it aired in New York a day after it was taped in Chicago. She, her primary comment was, you know, Karen, you don't really look good in that color. <laughs> it, wasn't, it, yeah, it wasn't you sounded intelligent or you really had a point to make or whatever. I didn't look good in that color. Um, but one, one time after that, do you want to take a break? Are we on kid tape? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, one time after that, I was on, a, Sally Jesse Raphael had a radio program in New York before she had a television show, which I actually only recently learned she ever had, and it's now, I think, over. But anyhow, um, and I was on the Sally Jesse Raphael show, and Sally asked me a question which was unfamiliar. Most of the questions, by the time you'd gone around this, were pretty familiar. What is sexual harassment? Who does it happen to? You know, how common is it? What are the effects? So, I knew all those questions and I had, you know, answers I was comfortable with. She said to me, have you ever been sexually harassed? Mm -hmm. um, and actually, my, I had thought about my answer to that, which was, it doesn't matter whether I have been, because this is not about me, this yeah. is about women's experience. But she pushed me on it. And so I finally told my own story of sexual harassment. Which, it's not that I was embarrassed to tell, it's that I didn't want the viewers to think this was my personal vendetta. Right. Um, so, but I told the story and I said, and I never told anyone about it, I didn't even tell my mother. And when I got home there was a phone call from my mother on my answering machine saying, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> you could have told me. <laughs> so, I knew she was listening. Uh, you know, I, by that time I was on television and radio a lot, and I didn't always tell my mother, but some friend had called her up and said, I hear your daughter on Sally Jesse Raphael. So my mother had turned it on, because she's local. So it was. And so really, of all the things you've done, this area is the one that really means the most to you. What? Oh, I don't know. I think loving Martha Stark means the most <laughs> to me. But I, I think that this... I think this is the biggest mark I've made. I think I'm privileged mm -hmm. to have been at the right place at the right time mm -hmm. and able to, and you know, with the right set of skills and experience. It wasn't, it was a great good fortune that I'd already been a member of New York Radical Feminists and mm -hmm. had worked on others, other speak outs. So knew that that would be a useful tool for breaking the silence. Uh, so. 
so I was fortunate to be able to have the role that I had mm -hmm. in breaking the silence and making sexual harassment mm -hmm. into a huh. phenomenon that women and men alike know about and that more women feel able to protest when they see it happening, certainly than they did prior to that. What a I'm change. proud of that. I'm what a change, too. Yeah. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's move on um, to your athletic uh, <laughs> accomplishments, because the big thing, besides being a swimmer and a triathlon and a bicyclist and everything, was uh, the gay games. Ah. That here, I just happened to have with me. I came prepared for this interview. My medals, these are from the Gay Hold Games in 1990. Oh, sorry. I want to see them. Ah, okay. These are from 1996, and these are from 1994. The Gay Games take place every four years. Yeah. Um, and I am, I've been a member of Team New York Aquatics, which is New York City's gay and lesbian swim team since its founding. It was founded right after the Gay Games in 1990, which were in San Francisco. So I've been a member and I've served as president of that team. I was president at the time of the Gay Games in 98, or maybe I had just stopped being president. In any case, um, and I've always, and for many years I was quite active in it. And when the Gay Games were in New York City, in 1994, I was coordinator of operations and volunteers for the swim meet. And the swim meet was a 1,200 athlete, 1,200 athlete, seven day event that took place at the asphalt green pool on the east side of Manhattan. And we knew this was coming, of course, four years ahead of time, but started planning for it eight months ahead of time and I as coordinator of volunteers spent probably 20 hours a week this was in addition to my job um, coordinating volunteers from around the country and around the city to work daily at the swim venue I had about 12 I'm sorry about 120 to 150 volunteers working at all times mm. Um, during the swim meet, I needed. We had eight lane, two times eight lanes of swimming going on. So we needed, and we, you need two timers on each lane. So just as ta clock timers, I needed 32 people. I also needed at least six people running the timing board, and those people had to learn how to run the electronic timing system by volunteering to work at kids' swim meets at Asphalt Green all that su all that winter. Mm -hmm. Uh, the coordinator of that, I mentioned this to you earlier, Anne, uh, the lead person in the electronic timing work was Edie Windsor, mm. who was, I think, the stage manager of One the of Rebels. Stage manager, yes. Um, and a woman who's well known to our community, although she does live on the South <laughs> Shore, um, and has was already at that time a good friend. So she took on this assignment out of affection, I think, and loyalty <laughs> to me, um, and did just a remarkable job at it. So anyhow, we had this huge event, and I also swam at this event, and competed <laughs> as a swimmer, and won these and other medals, uh, and just, the, the games in New York, because I was in charge of operations, were um, I, I didn't have much sense of what else was going on in terms of the other sports. Lucy, you competed in the games in New York as well. I, I missed everything except the swimming. I was at the pool at 6 in the morning and left at about 8 or 10 at night every day. In part that was because we had a problem caused by the equipment in the timing, and so we were always unraveling electronic mm -hmm. timing problems. Um, and so I spent the nights with a friend, Nina Eshoo, who lived, who's now also on the North Fork, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, who lived nearby, because I couldn't get home to Brooklyn and put in those hours. Um, but I did swim as well, and it was, it was an incredible mm -hmm. thrill to do that. When the games were in Amsterdam, Four years later, I 
went in just as a competitor. And I got to find out what it's like to be in a city that's hosting the gay games, <laughs> where people would walk up. Yeah, I was fortunate in that I also won some medals there, and I, after I won them, would walk around wearing them, because that's what athletes do in the gay game city <laughs> during the week of gay games. Um, and Dutch people would walk up to me and they'd say, oh, did you win that in the gay games? Um, welcome to the Netherlands. <laughs> they were so warm and welcoming. And it was so wonderful mm -hmm. to be in. Amsterdam is an incredibly open and tolerant city and has a you know, millennium long tradition of that. But you know, here we were, mm -hmm. the international lesbian and gay athletes all um, over their city. Um, and it was just wonderful to, to be there. Yeah. I also, in, the, in those gay games, because I was at that time executive director of the Legacy Foundation, the Legacy Foundation at the gay games gives the Legacy Cup to an outstanding female athlete of the games. Um, and, they, and they did it at the closing ceremonies and they designed this presentation ceremony that had me coming in on the back of a motorcycle with a gang of dykes on bikes <laughs> that came <laughs> roaring into this, this huge stadium going vroom vroom and I'm holding the cup up over my head and this absolutely gorgeous <laughs> dyke on bike at the front of the V keeps rem and they had to go up and over a few ramps to get a, you know in from wherever we were keeps reminding me to hold on to her hips tightly with my <laughs> legs. Because <laughs> I'm my hands are over my head holding the cup, um. right? And the announcer is saying something about, you know, the legacy cup. Um, which probably couldn't be heard over the roar, but that was also kind of a high moment in my life <laughs> to roar into this stadium with this cup. And then I stood on this little stage and made a presentation of the cup to the um, bas the women's basketball team from the Republic of Slovakia, oh. um, who were chosen because they were representative of female athlete participation in the games. In New York City, it had been given to a lesbian woman wrestler grandmother That's right. That's right. <laughs> by the name of yeah. Juanita. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to forget her name. I got yeah. to know her yeah. afterwards. Yeah. I missed the closing ceremonies because yeah. I was at the pool dealing with the results from the timing. Um, um, in 94. And I wasn't executive director of Legacy. I worked at CUNY Law School. Uh, what a wonderful time. It was a wonderful time. Yeah. I, wish wonderful I wanted time. to go to Amsterdam desperately. Amsterdam yeah. was great. I mean, for that. Amsterdam was great. Any other thoughts about work, play, fun? Uh, lovers. Here's lovers. Lovers. <laughs> um, Martha Stark, who would be here if she weren't at work right now, um, and is the Commissioner of Finance for the City of New York right now, so she doesn't ever get to cut out on Fridays, which is what I've done in order to be here with you, um, has been my lover for nearly 18 years. We bought this house together and come to it almost every weekend. We adore our lives out here um, with our friends, with this rich, I mean, heart-wise heart rich community in which the two of you are important focal mm -hmm. points. Um, and so I guess I want to salute you oh, for you. taking the effort to make this happen for us all, to, to create this historical record that, you know, I did say that I have a graduate degree in history. I, <laughs> <laughs> I relish the historic record, um, and you know, I'm proud to be a part in this community. You're a very rich part of this. Um, so I think that's it, right? Well, you are fabulous.